Uh, welcome everybody. I'm really delighted uh, to be here today. My name is Professor Jane Mills and I'm the Dean of the La Trobe Rural Health School. And it's my great honour to be welcoming you all to this very exciting seminar today. We've had an overwhelming response, which is fantastic. And I think it really indicates uh, the hunger that's out there for, for more information about FASD. FASD is an unacknowledged yet really significant condition that's increasingly being recognised in Australia. And every year on today, on September the 9th, is International FASD Awareness Day. And people around the world gather for events just like this one to raise awareness about the causes of FASD and the circumstances for families and individuals who live with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. The first FASD day took place in 1999 and the ninth day of the ninth month of the year was chosen in order to raise awareness about the importance of being alcohol free for the nine months of pregnancy. The La Trobe Rural Health School is really proud to contribute to the promotion of FASD awareness by offering this free webinar for professionals in the health and community services sector. We know it can be really difficult for professionals to gain access to FASD information and professional development, especially for clinicians in rural and regional areas. Based on the 900 plus registrations we received for this event, mostly from rural and regional Australia, we know that professionals from the health and community sectors have a strong interest to do more to support people with FASD and their families. And we're very pleased to welcome you to today's workshop. On that note, I'd like to introduce um, Uncle David Copley, uh, who is the La Trobe Rural Health School's Indigenous Academic Advisor, and who's going to provide an acknowledgement of country today. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jane, um, and welcome everybody. Um, before I start, I think, because I get asked this often, what's the difference between an acknowledgement to country and a welcome to country? And the reason is that um, I'm not on my traditional country, I'm on somebody else's. So, and, and we were going out to a lot of different countries for Aboriginal communities. So that's why we're doing the acknowledgement. And I will do it today um, in the language, in my traditional Aboriginal language. Nina Mani, Nayacho Yakandalia, Nayacho Yangandalia, Nainari David Tanda Copley, Yatyanda Gana, Naiwan Gandhi, Mani Nobudna, Aboriginal Yuta. So basically what I said was, hi, everybody, how are you? Um, my name is David Copley. My Aboriginal name is Tanda, which means red kangaroo. I'm a Ghana man. I pay respects to our elders past, present and future, and to your elders as well, wherever you're from. I pay respect to um, all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who might be on this webinar today. And I acknowledge that we're all meeting on different parts of Aboriginal land. And that's as important to us today as it always has been. I'd just like to say something about FASD because it's a challenge within Aboriginal communities, not because of alcohol consumption. We have communities that have high con consumption, but per head of population, we actually drink less than mainstream Australia, but it's important because of the lack of education within Aboriginal communities on FASD. I have a nephew who was a FASD baby. I've watched him grow up with all the problems associated with that. So for rural remote health as we are, um, FASD is still a challenge for Aboriginal communities. And one of the big challenges is how do we promote the education to Aboriginal families, not just the women, but to families, because it needs to be a family and a community objective. I wish you well with your webinar today, and thank you for having me. Thank you, David, that's excellent. Um, so it's my great pleasure now to introduce you to the speakers, um, and I'm going to um, go through their bios in the order in which they are speaking today. And then I'll be handing over to Dr. Karen Bagley, who's going to um, host uh, today's webinar. So Karen is our first speaker today. Um, Dr. Karen Bagley is a FASD researcher and a lecturer in, the, in social work at La Trobe University. 
Her research interest stems from her practice experience in child and adolescent mental health services with families affected by FASD. In uh, 2020, Dr Bagley was the recipient of the Australian FASD Centre for Research Excellence National Mid-Career Research Award. She was also the inaugural co-chair of the Australia and New Zealand FASD Clinical Network and now chairs the Victorian FASD Special Interest Group. Karen's also an ambassador for No FASD in Australia. Our second speaker today is Dr Katrina Harris. Uh, Katrina is a paediatrician and she's the head of development and community paediatrics at Monash Children's Hospital and of the recently established Victorian Fetal Alcohol Service, FICFAS. She's a member of the National Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Advisory Group, adjunct senior lecturer at Monash University in Paediatrics and a national examiner for the Royal Australian College of Physicians. Katrina's worked in public hospital paediatric settings for over 20 years with children with neurodevelopment developmental sorry differences children with challenges in thinking learning behavior social and communication skills in 2019 dr harris received an australian government grant to establish a victoria-wide fasd diagnostic assessment service for children aged between three and ten our third speaker today is angelina bruce and Angelina is a biological mother too and carer of a 12 year old child with diagnosed FASD. Angelina is a FASD advocate with the clear aim to end the stigma surrounding FASD in order to bring it out of the shadows, start conversations and shine a light on this invisible disability. Angelina has a particular passion for supporting other biological mothers with a strict no blame, no shame policy and a special emphasis on supporting women who are unable to stop drinking during their pregnancy with early diagnosis and early intervention planning for their children. And our final speaker today is Prue Walker. Prue is a social worker at the Victorian Fetal Alcohol Service, VicFAS, and provides FASD consultancy services to professionals and to families. Prue's background is in child protection and out of home care in both Victoria and the Northern Territory. She undertook a Churchill Fellowship in 2009, investigating models of care for children with FASD in the US and Canada. Prue de delivers workshops and training in relation to FASD, including assessment, prevention and case management. And she also provides FASD coaching to individuals and families and works as a mentor to adults with FASD with a focus on self-advocacy. Prue is a sessional teacher and social worker at La Trobe University as well, so that's great. We'd also like to welcome Robin Smith, who's a representative from No FASD Australia, the National Organisation for FASD, and that organisation talks to talk about, sorry, the services that that organisation provides for families and the information they provide for professionals. So I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, webinar, really excellent lineup of speakers, and I'd like to congratulate Karen and the team for organising today. Um, and to wish you very well uh, for the forthcoming discussions. So thank you very much. And over to you, Karen. So thanks, Jane, and welcome everyone to the event. I can see that we already have um, over 400 people who have um, come to join us today, and I'm sure we'll have more. Um, and so this is our event for International FASD Awareness Day. And in the next two hours, we aim to provide an introductory understanding and some referral pathways, and also some more information on where you can find out about FASD. So the webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email in the coming weeks with a link to the recording. Um, we had to shut off registrations because we had so much interest, which is fantastic. So we're very um, happy for you to share the recordings on with your coll colleagues when you get that link in your email. The webinar was open to anyone, um, but we are a Victorian Australian based group of presenters. So while some of the information is Victorian specific, most of it is relevant to everyone um, and we'll share resources relevant to people in Australia. But I know that we have a lot of colleagues from New Zealand with us today and I think a lot of the information will be relevant to you, even if the links aren't directly relevant. Um, we would love for you to help us to raise awareness of FASD through social media. So if you hear something today that you think others would be interested in, please tweet it 
um, or share it on some other social media platform and tag us. I've popped up some hashtags up there, Latrobe Faz Day, uh, Faz D, uh, Faz, Faz Day, um, and also my Twitter handle that you can use as well. I'd love for you to tag me so that we can see who's at the event as well. We really welcome during the webinar. So please feel free to put them in the Q&A section, not in the chat. We'll be reading them from the Q&A section, which you should be able to find at the bottom um, of the webinar screen. Um, and pop them in as you go along. So if you have a question for me or for, for Katrina, pop it in as you're going along. Um, and while we may not be able to answer all of them, um, we are having all of the speakers will be there at the end of the webinar and we'll answer as many as we can. So what are we going to cover today? Um, well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the nuts and bolts, the 101, what is FASD? Um, and then Dr. Katrina Harris is going to talk about the Vic, Vic FAS Diagnostic Clinic and a little bit about the diagnostic process. Um, we have a video from Angeline Bruce and she's going to talk to us about her personal experience uh, we've got a video because we had a few tech issues in our practice and we thought it might be easier if we videoed Angeline, but she is here today and she is able to answer questions at the end. Um, and then Prue Walker is going to talk, us at, talk to us about FASD informed practice and also where you can learn more about FASD. And we'll also have Robin Smith um, by, via video and potentially also to answer questions from NoFASD joining us towards the end. So we specifically decided to run a webinar for professionals working in health and community and human service sectors. And, and why is that? Well, much of my research is focused on professional responses to FASD. And there's actually been a lot of research on professional knowledge with regard to FASD in all different types of disciplines and sectors, in health, in community, in justice, in education. Um, and overall, it's found the same thing, that professionals often have limited or no understanding of FASD. And why, why is that? Well, we know that there is limited or no content around FASD in most undergraduate and health and allied health degrees. And we know that there's limited access to professional development around FASD and also professional development around how to ask about alcohol. But there's also misinformation in the community about alcohol and pregnancy. And that can make it really hard for professionals to ask about FASD. If we're asking our clients or our patients about FASD and they don't know what it's about, um, professionals uh, have expressed that they have concerns about creating stigma, about feeling like they're signaling individuals out. Um, and, and that can make it really difficult for professionals. Interestingly, in some research um, that I did a few years ago, uh, what I found was that professionals believe that FASD is actually really important. It's relevant to their practice, but one of the interesting findings was they felt like it really, um, well, each person that I interviewed was really not their area of practice. And what we found in that research is the people, the professionals working in disability, they thought, oh, it's relevant to disability, but it's actually probably a mental health issue. And then the people in mental health maybe thought, yeah, it's relevant to my practice, but I'm not sure whether it really fits into mental health. Maybe it fits into primary care. People in primary care thought, oh, maybe it's drug and alcohol and homelessness, etc. So, um, the reality for parents um, and, and professionals reported this in the research was that they, they weren't sure it wasn't their area and part of the reason was that they, they didn't necessarily know a lot about it. So they would refer parents on to another service thinking maybe that service was the place that they, that, that family could get support. Um, and the experience for families that we found out through research on families is that they often get passed from service to service, from professional to professional, 
um, each professional not necessarily knowing about FASD, but thinking that maybe somebody else knows better than them. So what does that tell us? Um, that tells us that um, it may be that you may be the first FASD informed professional that a family encounters. Um, and so what we hope today is that we can offer you some information and some pathways to find out more about FASD and about how you can best support people with FASD and their families. So what is FASD? So fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a disability and it's caused by prenatal alcohol exposure. In uh, FASD, alcohol causes damage to the brain and the central nervous system. And that affects the person's cognitive function, their behavior, their learning, and also their social relationships. But increasingly, FASD is now being recognized as a whole of body condition. And alcohol can damage anything that is developing at the time that the fetus is exposed. And an important thing to remember is that even though it has fetal in the title, in the title fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, the FASD is a lifelong condition that the damage that occurs by um, alcohol exposure is permanent and it's lifelong. So alcohol is a teratogen, which means that it's a toxin that's known to cause birth defects and permanent brain injury to a fetus. And alcohol crosses the placenta and creates the same or higher blood alcohol level in the fetus as the mother. So alcohol can kill cells, it can decrease neuron production, it can cause abnormal cell migration, it can cause um, abnormal neurotransmitters. Um, and those are the things that can create damage to the brain, the central nervous system and the rest of the body. And alcohol can impact the development of the fetus at any time during pregnancy. So people with FASD have brain differences. And these slides come from some FASD brain imaging research. And the image on the left-hand side of your screen is a neurotypical brain image. And the other four images show brains of people with FASD. And this particular study was looking at the abnormalities of the corpus callosum in children exposed to alcohol. And the corpus callosum, if you have a look at that first picture, um, in the middle of that, you can see a little a rainbow shaped arc. And that's the corpus callosum. And if you actually go along to the pictures, you can see it's absent in some of those brain images. Um, but we don't need to know a lot about neurology to see the impact that alcohol has had on these brains. So why is it important to see these brains? I think it's really important because in effect, I like to describe FASD as an invisible physical disability. Why is it helpful to talk about it in terms of a physical disability? I think it helps us to be mindful that we need to make adjustments and accommodations for people with FASD, just like we would for someone who has a physical disability. We wouldn't expect a child with a vision impairment to read a blackboard. We wouldn't expect somebody in a wheelchair to climb the stairs but we often have expectations of people with FASD that are unfair and unrealistic. And that's because we might see the behavior concern, but we don't necessarily think about the brain impairment that underlies that behavior. So how much alcohol is safe? There's no known safe amount or safe time to consume alcohol during pregnancy. And the NHMRC recommendations is to prevent harm from alcohol to their unborn, unborn child. Women who are pregnant or planning a pregnancy should not drink alcohol. That's pretty straightforward. But I often hear people say, I know somebody who consumed alcohol during pregnancy, um, or I've heard of somebody, um, and they don't have FASD. And there's a few things to consider here. 
We know that binge drinking and that daily drinking is particularly risky, but there are also a whole range of other factors that may increase or decrease the teratogenic effects of alcohol. So moderating factors are things like maternal health and genetics, how much, you know, how, um, how alcohol is metabolized by different people, nutrition, stress, and a, and a range of other epigenetic factors. The only way that we know that alcohol harm will be prevented is from abstaining from alcohol consumption because there's no evidence that there's a safe amount. What we do know is that there's increasing evidence, including research from Victoria and my colleagues from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, that small amounts of alcohol may impact the developing fetus. The other thing to consider is that FASD is an underdiagnosed condition. And often people with FASD are diagnosed with other things before they're diagnosed with FASD. Some common examples are ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, reactive attachment disorder, global developmental delay, autism spectrum disorder and conduct disorder. And it's not to say that those diagnoses are necessarily wrong. They can be co-diagnoses. Um, but they also, some of those diagnoses may be actually a result um, or part of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So how prevalent is FASD? Well, it's the leading cause of preventable disability in the Western world. And I've got a little asterisk there around preventable. And that's because FASD, if, if there's no alcohol exposure during pregnancy, um, the baby won't have FASD. But to say it's 100% preventable, which is often what we see out there in health promotion, that FASD is 100% preventable, um, is a little bit simplistic. I remember one person said to me, um, FASD is 100% is preventable, but so is war. Um, and we really need to recognise some of the complex factors um, that interplay with this condition and recognise that um, whilst FASD can be preventable, we, it won't always be preventable in every case and we need to support families um, and individuals with FASD. So you may be surprised that more children are born each year with FASD than spina bifida, cerebral palsy and Down syndrome combined. And international prevalence studies um, suggests that one to 4% of the population is affected by FASD. So if we think of Victoria, the Victorian population is six, uh, approaching 6 million, and we conservatively think that maybe 2% of the population is affected by FASD, we're talking about 120,000 people in Victoria who are affected by FASD. There, have, there haven't actually been um, broad prevalence studies in Australia. And one of the reasons for that is that prevalence studies are really expensive. Um, but we know that that one to 4% um, prevalence rate is probably very relevant to Australia because when we look at the Australian um, alcohol consumption and, um, and unplanned pregnancy, and we compare that to the countries that have done these studies that were either on par or we have higher alcohol consumption in Australia. So there's been two smaller Australian studies. One was in a youth justice detention centre um, in Western Australia, and that found that 36% of the young people in that youth justice detention centre had FASD. And actually 89% had at least one domain of severe neurodevelopmental impairment. There was also a study in a remote community, it was a remote Aboriginal community, and it found 19.4 of children aged seven to nine years were affected by FASD. And I think it's really important here, and David raised this a little bit earlier in his acknowledgement, that there's a bit of a um, myth out there that FASD is an Aboriginal issue. Um, and it's important to remember that alcohol can impact anyone um, in any community. 
but also to acknowledge the intergenerational trauma that Aboriginal people have experienced. And in the FASD world, to recognise that Aboriginal people in Australia have actually been the leaders um, in Australian research um, and in, in also raising awareness in this country. They've very much been the leaders in this space. Um, FASD, we know from prevalent studies over, overseas that children who are in the care of child protection and out of home care um, and children and adults in the justice system and, special and children who are in special education um, have particularly high rates of FASD. And I think it's important to note that 93% of adults um, who have FASD have a coexisting mental health diagnosis. So it's something that we probably need to consider in relation to mental health services. It's important when we talk about FASD that we take a no blame, no shame approach. Australia has very high levels of alcohol consumption and more than 30% of pregnancies in Australia are unplanned. So many women may consume alcohol before they even know that they're pregnant. There's also mixed messages out there in the community about what level of um, alcohol consumption is safe. And as I've told you today, there is no level that's safe. But there's also misinformation provided by health professionals and, or well, they can be. And that stems from that lack of understanding about FASD that I've talked about before. We also need to be mindful um, that it may be really difficult for some um, women to stop drinking alcohol during pregnancy. Um, and we need to support those women. If we have a look here um, at the, the slide, um, what we can see is some images, um, some media images around FASD. Um, and we can see very clearly they're still really um, stigmatising images in the media. And there's also still stigmatising images in campaigns. And whilst prevention campaigns like the baby in the alcohol bottle that we can see here may have good intentions to create awareness, they can be incredibly stigmatising. Um, and we need to create an environment where women feel supported to ask for support without fear of judgment. And be mindful that alcohol causes FASD not women. So have a look at the picture here. Can you tell if someone has FASD by the way that they look? I'll just give you a second to have a look at these faces. When people think of FASD, they often think of specific facial features. And there are, there are facial features associated with part of the spectrum with FASD. But actually 83% of individuals with FASD don't have the specific FASD facial features. And that's because the FASD facial features only occur if the fetus is exposed to alcohol during pregnancy when those facial features are forming. And I think it's something, and maybe Katrina can correct me later, but between day 17 and day 21, the facial features are forming. So we're talking about a very um, short window. But what do we see? Well, we see learning difficulties. We see developmental delays. We often see sleep problems. But mostly when a child is referred to services, its behaviour is for behaviour concerns. And these are some of the behaviour concerns that are really common. People who make mistakes over and over, boundary problems, like stealing and inappropriate touching, um, pe people who may not follow instructions, um, an individual who can't keep friendships, who has angry outbursts, maybe they're easily manipulated by their peers, disorganised, uh, undertakes risky behaviour and distracts us, others in the classroom and a big one is lying and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that later. But behind these behaviours is brain impairment. And these are the neurodevelopmental domains that are examined in a diagnostic assessment for FASD. People can have challenges in all of these areas or some of them. 
But in order to reach the threshold for a diagnosis, they need to have significant impairments. And for the psychologists in our, in our webinar today, two, two standard deviations below the mean in at least three of these areas. So why is it important to remember that different individuals have, um, so what's, sorry, what is important to remember is that different individuals have different patterns of strengths and deficits. And one of the reasons for this is that the timing of alcohol exposure will determine which developing systems and structures are affected. So different timings of alcohol exposure will result in a different pattern of strengths and deficits. Um, this is also the reason why some people with FASD have facial features and some don't. Uh, and as I said before, if there's no alcohol exposure during the pregnancy, time during pregnancy when facial features are forming, the person won't have facial features. There's actually a really great video um, by Dr. Pr Vanessa Spiller, and Prue's going to share a link to her web, web page. Um, which talks about the variability that we see um, with people with FASD and why we see that variability. But what I've decided to do is pick a couple of common areas because we don't have enough time to go through all the brain domains today um, where people with FASD have challenges. So adaptive functioning, we, um, we're talking about skills for daily living at home and at school and in the community and it includes personal independence, social responsibility, social communication, and those performance of everyday tasks. And some common things that we see with people with FASD, especially adults, is poor money management. Also things like safety concerns, that concept of no stranger danger, poor self-care, and that poor self-care may be driven by a range of things that might be around disorganisation, but it also may be around sensory concerns. Making friends may be difficult. Um, uh, one thing that we find from FASD research is that um, as people with FASD have said they found it difficult making friends and also keeping friends, and they're also easily manipulated. Challenges with executive functioning with people with FASD is really common. So executive functioning are those higher order processes involved in thought and action and decision making. They includes our capacity for reasoning, our capacity for planning, goal setting, organisation, strategy, working memory, flexible thinking, and self-regulation and monitoring. And one thing that um, is often particularly tricky for people with FASD is understanding abstract concepts. And so they often don't understand sarcasm or metaphors or that you may be joking about something. Another example would be time management. So these are often the people who um, may not turn up to appointments uh, and we realise that they've actually left to get onto the bus to go to the appointment at the time that the appointment is actually taking place. And time management is really difficulty, difficult. Difficulty changing strategies midstream, difficulties grasping um, cause and effect. Uh, and that can be shown in, in many ways. Um, but, you know, these are the kids who often don't respond to the sticker charts um, for reward systems because they actually can't link their behaviour to actually getting that reward. And also they might not necessarily respond to the punishment because they can't necessarily link the action to the punishment and then generalise it in the next time around. So difficulty grasping cause and effect. And this is maybe one of the drivers why we see so many young people in the, in the justice system. Um, and they find, difficult, find it difficult to learn from experience. Language and communication is also a real challenge for people with FASD and it may not be immediately apparent so someone may have um, strengths in expressive language and they may be able to seem like they communicate really well, but their receptive language, their ability to understand and make sense of what you're saying to them um, is impaired. So examples might be they might tell stories that make no sense. They can repeat the instruction and, and we've probably all had that experience where when we're checking to make sure someone understands, we get them to repeat the instruction. Um, for people with FASD, they might be able to repeat it, 
but they might not understand it or they might not be able to enact it. They might make statements out of the blue um, and also repeat or perseverate on words or phrases or ideas. And another really common area is, is around memory. So your capacity to take in, encode, store and retrieve verbal and visual information. And working memory in particular, which is our um, system for temporarily storing and managing information. And it's required to carry out complex cognitive tasks like learning and reasoning and comprehension. And so we might see people who might not be able to follow multi-step instructions. They might not be able to remember the rules. And they also might not be able, if, even if they do remember the rules, they might not be able to apply those rules in different settings. Um, confabulation, which I meant, uh, which I talked about before, uh, often people are concerned that FAS, that people with FASD are lying and that they're lying a lot, but it may be that they actually have trouble remembering the answer or trouble constructing the answer so that they actually make up information that fills in that missing gap of information. And we often see that these are children, young people at school who must learn and relearn and they might see that they've got it one day and you think that they've got it and then you go to the next day and they don't remember. And it's often something that, um, that children in school get in trouble for and also trouble learning basic maths facts um, and, and general facts and reading. One of the characteristics of FASD, which can make it a little bit difficult from other disorders, is the variability in functioning. So we can see here that this person may be 18 years of age, but their reading ability may be at the level of a 16 year old. We're just using an age because it helps us gauge where they are developmentally. But their social skills might be at the age of a seven year old. Um, and their money and time concepts might be at an eight-year-old. So their strengths in some areas don't match the challenges in other areas. And the issue is with that is that the person may be, appear to be more competent than they actually are. And I suppose the risk is then that they don't necessarily get the support that they need if we see the strengths but we don't really understand that there are also other deficits. So diagnosis, why is diagnosis um, important? Often one of the things that I hear is, is diagnosis just another label? Um, people with FASD get labeled all the time. They get labeled as difficult. They get labeled as defiant. They get labelled as lazy. They get labelled as uncaring. A diagnosis is different. A diagnosis provides understanding and a pathway forward. And a diagnosis is important because it helps us to understand the cause of behaviours and to provide interventions and supports that consider brain function. Standard intervention approaches that we often use to address behaviour concerns are often not effective because they require skills and cognitive abilities in areas that, with people, um, that people with FASD have deficits. That's not to say that we throw out all of our standard intervention approaches, but one of the things a diagnosis, a FASD diagnosis gives us, is it gives us an understanding of that professional's unique challenges and skills, and then we can adapt those approaches to that person. A diagnosis assists the person and the family to plan for the future. And that's really important because FASD is a lifelong condition. And it provides a basis to consider the strengths and adjust expectations. And it's often our expectations that are making life difficult for people with FASD. So if we adjust our expectations and make them more realistic, then people with FASD can thrive. It's an indicator for providing an interdisciplinary approach to supporting the person and their family. And also it can aid in the prevention of future alcohol exposed pregnancies. We know that if we diagnose FASD, that it can be a protective factor because in some cases we may be able to support mum in the next um, pregnancy 
um, so that that pregnancy could be an alcohol-free pregnancy. All right, so I'm now, um, I might go back to the reference slide. I'm now um, going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Katrina Harris, to talk to you a little bit more about diagnosis. Um, Dr. Harris is the leader of the Vic Faz FASD Diagnostic Clinic at the Monash Children's Hospital. Um, and she is going to talk to you about the clinic and also a little bit more about diagnosis. Thank you, Katrina.